There will always be somebody stronger, faster, and smarter than you. Surviving depends on your adaptability to change. Those who are the most adaptable are dialed in. Welcome to the show, Robin Austin. Uh, Robin is uh, 35 years in technology, 17 years in cybersecurity, focusing on evolutionary, disruptive, beneficial, money-making solutions. She is a board CISO, having created cybersecurity governance frameworks for C-level leaders and basically an all-around trusted advisor. Robin, are you ready to get dialed in? Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Kyle. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. So uh, jumping right into the first topic here, uh, in your 35 years, you've kind of developed this framework, if, if you will, a, of excellence in the art of technology. So technology is an art form that is uh, picking the right vendors, evaluating technology in itself. That is an art form. So uh, why don't we uh, begin with that? Well, you know, with all the things that have been going on the past few months, I do want to address the fact that, you know, there are a couple of lessons that are learned and they're very simple. It, you know, together is better. Um, one of the things that that we really need to focus on is removing silos and remember that together is better. And we have a whole ecosystem around that. And Recently, Elevate Exchange community was uh, formed by C's. It's a new group that was formed by C's for C's. Now, I helped spearhead it, but it's a whole community where everybody collaborates, everybody shares, and therefore everybody benefits. That's number one. Number two, you know, partnerships in the vendor community, we need our vendors. OK, we never say that that much, but we really do. And, you know, I will tell you that there are one of the things that I've learned is having the right vendors with the same integrity and the same ideology as you have as a company and as a person has been, uh, you know, a survival has met the difference between, you know, uh, uh, well, it's it's helped me survive. Put it that way. My company survived, and I, I have to I have to shout out. I have I have to shout out with at least there's four vendors that well, including Catch Cloud, which is your company, um, and uh, uh, vendors like Merlin and Lastline and uh, Unitrends. You know those four vendors. I have to throw out uh, and and. Uh, you know, shout out at them because they have the same ideology as I do. And it's together is better. And as a trusted advisor, they've helped me be, you know, a lot more resilient, um, you know, and help a lot of other people. So it's just, you know, it's not just about you. It's about your whole community. And Elevate Exchange was formed by that. So um, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Right. Yeah, absolutely. No, that does. And so Elevate Exchange, since you mentioned it, you already brought it up. Um, I didn't know we were going to bring it up this early, but that's, that's perfect. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Like, what is Elevate Exchange? Well, it's a community by C's for C's. And its mission, well, is to fill gaps. I mean, you know, as C-level people, we talk about the enormous amount of gaps in every faction of our business. And, you know, we can't do it all, but because the, it's community driven, we're hoping to help, you know, not only with the challenges of those gaps, but also, you know, have those people in the room that may have had the experience to help share that and, and kind of, you know, fill those gaps. One of them, I got to tell you just a little story. Um, I was at a a CISO dinner. Um, and it was surrounded by a lot of my peers. And I was standing there chatting with one of my peers. And another peer walked up and said, Robin, I want to sit on a board. I think I need to follow this path um, as far as my career development. And you know what? <laughs> that was the third link that helped me bring together Elevate Exchange. I mean, a actually help me put the effort into forming it because I, you know, I realized the only time we work on our career is when we're laid off, fired or acquired. So, you know, we talk about all the time about, 
you know, uh, how do I put it? Um, hiring challenges that we have in organization, but we never talk about our own. So that's just one gap. Oh, that, no, that is so true. I mean, you go to any networking event across the country, you're going to find the majority of people there are in the market for jobs. It's, it, when, it should probably be the other way around. Like you should be there when you have a job. You should be networking before you need a new job, right? Um, That's the point. Yeah. I don't, careful what the word should. You could be networking before you have a, have uh, before you need a new job, right? Um, right. You could be doing, and that's what Elevate Exchange is. The premise is right. Yes, that's and that's only one gap. Right, right, right. So how did how did all that come to be? Like, how did how did you? I mean, you kind of you kind of painted the picture of the problem, but so you know, Casey Yarbrough, uh, shout out to you. He's running Elevate IT. So somewhere along that path, you run into Casey Yarbrough, and then this it's like, tell us that story. Well, you know, I got acquired um, with. I'm just going to go back to to the capital company that I used to work for, and how I became, you know, trusted advisor, you mentioned trusted advisor and trusted advisor is a term that we a lot of times think is a lot overused. So it can mean a lot of different things. Well, back in the day when I worked for a capital company, I, I literally, I was hired as a strategist to do due diligence around, well, investments. And part of them, there were four areas of concern for the investors and one of them was technology. So I'm going back a little ways so that you can understand how I became a trusted advisor in the first place because it was really greenfield. You know, it was I was already doing a lot of the things that our peers needed from a, you know, they needed to have this kind of information and it wasn't in their job description really. And it's not really a skill set for their people. I mean, it's not, they're so busy running the company and that's what they need to be doing. Okay. It's just that they get thrown in the mix every time they have to evaluate something. And it's, it's not that they don't have the wherewithal. It's just that, you know, they're stretched so thin already. So my peers came to me while I was already doing this and started asking me for advice, you know, just, okay, so what are you looking at in this area? We're looking at this. What do you think? And so little by little, it became known in the marketplace that I, you know, I had this knowledge and I just shared it because it, why not? Um, I mean, I was very truthful. <laughs> I have a tendency to be very direct, as my peers know. Um, they laugh about it a little bit, I hope. Um, so from there, you know, I got acquired. Uh, we built it um, and it became very successful, the capital company. And we got acquired a couple of years ago. Well, out of that came I want my swan song. It, and also for the past 10 years, my peers have been saying, we need this. We need that because they came to me for other things. So it just was a green, you know, it was just, you know, they knew I was open to any kind of uh, input or any kind of question that they might ask. So little by little, it became, uh, I became that trusted advisor. And I'm not saying they came to me for everything, but it was more or less a collaboration. You know, they need it. Nobody can work alone. Together is better. So, you know, it, it ended up being where my swan song was, you know, oh, well, they, you know, we talked, we've talked about filling the gaps among my peers for a long time, but nobody, nobody really was doing it effectively. And I, I don't mean to say that there aren't other companies out there trying their best, but it has to come from us for us. Okay. We understand what we need. We understand how to communicate with each other. It's, it's those outside looking in. They're really not versed in those kinds of things. So as a swan song, so I, I, well, my peers, I went to them and said, and they kept saying, well, Robin, if you build it, we will come. I went, okay. Well, and I pointed at him and said, well, okay, I may hold you to that. Right. All right. Yeah. So I thought, well, OK, so for a couple of years, I started looking around for some kind of support system because together is better, you know. And frankly, I have a full time job. This is my swan song. So I met Casey Yarbrough 
and oh my gosh, um, he's he's so much like me, and I feel sorry for him in a way because he thinks like me. Um, you know, I get two sentences in, and he already knows where I'm going with my thought process, and he's you know one of two things. He usually isn't wrong, okay, um, and he's he has the most utmost integrity. Uh, so he, he had 25 years in the event business. And one of the things I wanted to do with Elevate Exchange was to give our people a voice, to let our people be seen. Okay. So not just speaking engagements, but, you know, also, which is part of what Casey brings to the table, um, as his 25 year veteran in events. And he stretched out. He was working. He had worked for another company and was just starting on his own. So we literally found it was timing, you know, or what I call a God thing. I mean, I'm a I'm a very God person. So people walk in your door when you when you you're you're supposed to have them. And he is he is he has provided the infrastructure for us as a a uh, community from, from for Elevate Exchange within his own event structure. So it's led to my ability and our community's ability to actually launch back in January. And the room was full. It was awesome. Okay. We had four really awesome vendors as well. Okay. That came along and supported us and also benefited. So it's a win, win, win situation for everyone. And that's why uh, the community was formed. Right, right. And and how how critical is it for um, uh, an IT leader, a, a C-level, even an IT director and anyone in the IT field, how critical is it for them to develop this personal brand, if you will, of getting up there and doing speaking engagements, getting on shows like this? Uh, you, do you have any stories that you could share around that? I know I didn't put oh. Yes. I mean, you know, we get buried. I mean, especially, you know, now uh, the launch for Elevate Exchange was January 16th was about the time. But we launched and had a full room. And to be honest with you, there were a lot that called me at the last minute. A lot of my peers, you know, sent me texts, sent me emails going, you know, I've had an incident at work. I can't make it, but I'll come to the next one. So, you know, they got it. OK, my peers have got it. It's just now that we're looking to come back and we've uh, with with Casey's help um, and your help, uh, we've pivoted. In order to do a lot more things online, we we had planned to do, you know, video uh, broadcasts for people, get speaking engagements for our peers, you know, video broadcast, podcast, you know, all of that. And that's part of why I'm on today is to make sure that people actually, you know, on the Elevate IT or under Elevate Exchange, under, under the Elevate IT website, there is, you know, a registration link for uh, your calendar in order to get on this show. Now, you have to qualify and you have to be a member of Elevate Exchange. Of, El of Elevate Exchange, but it's easy. All you got to, all you have to do to be it, to be on uh, a member of Elevate Exchange is to be a director or above functioning. It doesn't have to be title wise. It's it's about the area of responsibility. Um, so you could be a manager, you know, you could be the only IT person in a government, you know, city government, and that's fine. Okay, you are your senior level executive. And then all you have to do is become a member. And we have a survey, you know, a little form you fill out to become a member. And then you can schedule your broadcast. And we're going to post those broadcasts on dialed in to Elevate Exchange. And Kyle, you've been very instrumental in that support system in order to get that out as part of our community. Yeah, does no, that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely does. And uh, and what's the, what's the cost of this membership? Just because you oh, there's no cost. There, there you go. No, there's so, no cost. Like, like, um, like you said earlier, in it together, right? So it's about bringing bringing all these people together uh, and, and into a group, a support system. And the speaking engagements, you know, 
Kyle, uh, Kyle, I have to say that, uh, you know, Casey has been uh, uh, the greatest partner in this because, you know, he has allowed me to have a lot of input into, you know, getting some people on board, getting, getting, uh, you know, the way the, the uh, ele he's added uh, Elevate IT, uh, a VIP room uh, that's become an Elevate Exchange, uh, another meeting for Elevate Exchange within his organization, but he pays for it all, okay? Um, so in all fairness, um, I have to say he's been the greatest partner and been the most supportive person. And so um, we're going forward. I will tell you that although I we were, I, I plan to talk to you about this at the end of this conversation, this is a perfect lead in to um, on May 7th, we have James Carpenter of Scott, Scottish Right Children's, um, who sees so for that organization, uh, who is going to be the first virtual Elevate Exchange. Our January 16th was live, okay? And we hope to get back to live sometime. But in the meantime, we're going to do virtual so that we can continue to share and collaborate together. And May 7th, we will get out. Uh, it will be posted on the Elevate IT. It is already posted on the Elevate IT uh, website. And uh, I will be sharing the flyer that uh, Casey helped me develop so that I can get it out to our community so that they can still continue to be a part of the community as we go forward. I still want to make sure that though, that they become a member and then they schedule their broadcast. Yeah, absolutely. That's critical. Uh, and, and it's amazing what you get, what, what you guys are trying to do for the community, bring in with together. I, I want, I want to pivot now back to, if we will, um, the main topic of excellence in the art of technology and go deeper into this trusted advisor. I know we explained it a little bit, but, it, but in your 35 years, you've come across, trusted advisors that probably didn't even call themselves that. Um, and then, you know, but they were that they exemplified that. So, so what is that? What is that characteristic in your opinion that makes somebody a trusted advisor and, and not, and not just a, a sales rep for whatever company, right? There's, right. A, well, there's a big delineation between sales rep and trusted advisor. Well, I had a column in CIO.com before they also changed their, uh, they they became uh, their their policy changed quite a bit. Um, but I did have a column on CIO.com. It was called um, Truth Will Out. Okay? Truth Will Out. Truth Will Out. My column. And I, I had a posts every week on that uh, platform for quite a while. And we've pushed those or pulled those some of those uh, articles um, onto the blog for Elevate IT, which is really the blog for Elevate Exchange, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so Truth Will Out says it all. You have to have a level of integrity that, you know, is beyond reproach. And that means that sometimes the decisions you make um, and the communication you, you impart is is the truth you 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 can you always have to tell the truth so when you're doing evaluations i mean so i at welsh harris at, at the capital company that i used to work for you know i did due diligence and my team did due diligence on wow 100 to 200 possible opportunities um every year and you know, in those, and a lot of those were technology. So having said that, you know, we we were able to find out, you know, where the weak spots were. And, you know, although communicating that, you know, I'm not going to be in your face about that kind of thing. It's the fact that I had people come to me during that time frame and said, well, hey, Robin, we're going to look at this uh, before we do what are your thoughts? And sometimes I would say, well, I have my concerns, you know, based on your environment or your ecosystem, I have my concerns. Or, or and, on the history of that solution. Oh, right? well, yeah. And it is based on the history of 
the due diligence that I'd done for, for example, um, we did invest in a, a technology that going back years, um, you know, Cisco dominated the market for, you know, firewalls, right? Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of companies that built a better mousetrap during, you know, many, many, many years ago. And, you know, everybody had Cisco ASAs, everybody, okay? So, you know, when they built a better mousetrap, there were, um, there were a couple of really good alternatives out there that added a lot of functionality uh, to the firewall. And that was really the beginning of, you know, malware protection at that level, at the, you know, at the edge where, you know, that wasn't a part of, uh, you know, that really the firewall was very limited under the Cisco ASAs. But everybody since then, you know, if, if I tell you that today and you weren't a part of that time frame, you're going to look at me cross-eyed and go, excuse me, but they've been around forever. No, they haven't been around forever. So we did due diligence on several of those com companies coming into that market space. And you'd think, you know, everybody's out there in technology going, oh, I got to, you know, I got to invent something new. Well, these two companies already had a market. OK, the market was built. They just built a better mousetrap and frankly, um, with a lot of extra functionality. Well, that's very good. That's very good. Except for, you know, it's all well and good when you have the extra functionality. Now, now you as a C or as a company would have to determine, OK, so in my re do my resources, do I have the bandwidth for my resources to be retrained on a completely new tool? OK, right, right. I mean, that's, that's a huge part of it. Yeah, I mean, especially when it, that's really the top priority when it comes to any kind of technology. And most vendors don't, they, you know, they, they get their head down and sometimes they can't communicate effectively. It's not that they don't have a great product. It's just there's communication gaps. Oh, yeah. Like like, like something basic, like, hey, we're going to switch our phone system. Like, right. But we're switching it to get like to these two features, which, yeah, they're great. But we have to disrupt the entire organization to get those two extra features. So, like, we have to evaluate the risk of doing that. Right. right. And that's part of the due diligence. So, you know, when you look at back, back to the story I was telling around this firewall change. OK, and I picked that up because it's something everybody can can identify with, at least at my age. Mm -hmm. OK, and that that was the, the major challenge. And nobody ever talked about it. But for us, the major the top major concern was culture. OK, and our resources and whether or not that pivot and it is a pivot to a new tool would be worth the risk and the cost justified. Okay, and there were, you know, in some of these better mousetrap technology tools, you know, there were challenges with implementation. You know, great, great you know, complexity brings about, you know, additional challenges with implementation. If the vendor company doesn't build in a ease of it's not about having the sexy dashboard it's about how you know how effective is the technology and how easy is it to implement how without a, a lot of my resources as a c person involved in that implementation i already have to do training they already have to and and if the dashboard is resemblance to what they're already used to looking at, then that's a plus. So I'm just talking about some very few things that my peers right now that are watching this will identify with. And well, they'll just go, well, duh. OK, but some of the vendors out there or other people out there that may be watching this broadcast may not think about culture is first and resources is part of that culture. Got it, got it. So um, you mentioned like the Palo Alto versus Cisco story, and I, I love that one. Um, how often do you think we miss these like Palo Alto companies? Like there's, there's like in, in the sense of um, hyperbolizing Palo Alto as like this golden nugget company that exists right now that maybe you don't even know about. 
And there's there's plenty of those in every little vertical, every little uh, technology faucet, right? There is. Yeah. Well, it's 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 a matter of governance inside a company. You know, the the decision makers have to decide whether or not um, the risk and the cost is worth the leap to a new tool. And, you know, there are factors facing brand new technology that um, that could that have to play a role. And I'm just going to mention a couple, you know, brand new companies coming out in the market, this disruptive technology, which I'm sorry, I love I'm a disruptor person. I'm not saying all C's are, but I'm the kind of person that I look at disruptive technology because they tend to. They have a tendency to fill the gaps, and I like gap fillers, okay? Fill the gaps that I may not currently have in tools that I have in place. And a lot of my tools may be a lot more expensive, okay, than even what they're coming up with because technology evolves. Now, many years ago, there were a lot more companies with me as their leadership that weren't willing to make that disruptive leap as easily because, well, you know, why why fix it if it ain't broke, right? Right. Com That's number one. Comality. Yeah. And number two, um, if if it's uh, if it's a disruptive technology and it's a new company, you know, their their uh, exit strategy may be, I want to get bought. Which, and that back in the day, you know, people didn't <laughs> people like me or people in my position. Not like me, but people in my position, you know, it wasn't really thought of much about being bought. Now it's an exit strategy. OK, it's always OK. New company maybe out there 18 months, 24 months. And now, I mean, there are even companies out there that, you know, are less than that. that are getting snapped up. Well, the reason why they're getting snapped up is because the older companies and Innovation inside a technology that's already built is extremely costly. Okay. And anytime you buy something, if you have to have a additional cost placed on that innovation, that passes along to the to anybody purchasing. You know, you've heard the old adage that, you know, everything gets passed along to the consumer. It does. It, it everybody gets everybody shares in in the cost in order to keep that company working. Well, back to the disruptive technology, you know, it now there are many larger companies like Cisco who pivoted in order to be resilient. They bought Duo, they bought other technologies out there in order to be rel continue to be relevant in the marketplace, okay? All right, they've had to, yeah. They've had to. Now, adapt. And and that's a that that can be a good thing or can be a bad thing, you know. It for whoever purchased them in the first place. But before that, there was this gap in time where disruptive technology got purchased, and it ended up being not as good for the uh, the buyer. There have been many times that 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 wasn't a good thing. That is pivoted, though. That has changed because now we have Oracle buying companies where Oracle didn't buy companies. Now they're buying technology. You know, we've got major companies out there buying technology. So now there's a lot more confidence at my position to go ahead and, and uh, invest in disruptive technology to fill those gaps. You know, what are you going to do? Keep the gaps? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it, it, technology evolves too fast and it is to solve problems. The whole reason technology came into being was to add value and to solve problems. And those vendors that I do due diligence on, they're, they're doing, you know, their roadmaps. I mean, one of the major communications is what's your roadmap? Okay. You need to know. And if they're, you're not asking that, then you need to know what that is. And, the point is, is that that roadmap, you know, that means that you'll know if that's may, maybe a kind of, in, that's kind of an investment protection for you. Okay. 
Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So if a company didn't produce the roadmap after you requested it, that would be a very alarming to you. Uh, from, or, from or both what, the vendor side and advising side, right? Well, and or what's in there. Yeah, yeah. And, and, or what's in there. So there are many things, though, that go along with due diligence that are not just from an investment protection, but everything from an investment protection for investors are the same that goes that we have to look at. And a lot of times we miss those. And because I was able, frankly, it was the best decision I made because I was able to be a part of that team and be able to have that experience that I literally became a trusted advisor to my peers. That's what a trusted advisor needs to be. Excellent, excellent. So um, as, we, as, we, as we go about here, we're, we're getting towards the end here. A few more, th few more things came uh, popped up for me. So let's say that you picked the wrong vendor, right? Um, in, in a C-level position or in a, in a director management level position. What happens when you pick the wrong vendor? Like what could happen when you pick the wrong vendor? Well, it becomes shelfware is number one. Number two, um, you, am, you have a bad implementation or I say bad, that's not really a good word. It's, it's in effect, it's not as effect. It could be ineffectual or it could be half effectual, okay? A portion of it could be effectual. Um, but the problem is, is that means that your budget's spent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And if you, if you make the wrong, that's why it's so uh, key for you to have to, to these disruptive technologies. They're coming, they're thrown it. I mean, every time you turn around, you got a new disruptive technology out there. I mean, every time you're turning around. So, so how, how, how do you be confident in your decisions then? Like with, you know, with uh, unlimited options uh, and, you know, probably company A and company B, more than likely they could probably do the exact same job. They probably could. So how, how do you become completely confident in those decisions? Well, um, it's a, it's you a know, question. <laughs> I've talked, it's very difficult. Um, I mean, the reason why, uh, you know, you, you, you try to do the best you can. I mean, there, there's nobody out there in my position that doesn't, or in the C-level position that doesn't try to do the best they can. The challenge is, is that, you know, you already have a very short staff team running the company. And then you have to pull some of those people off in order to do due diligence around those technologies for your environment. And I'm not saying you shouldn't. I am saying you need to have, I mean, Mike, I, I formed a, a company inside Welsh in order to, it, it was more centered around security at the time for that very reason, because it became evident that our ability to do those kinds of things for our peers uh, made it easy for them to, to have trust, at least the beginning stages of trust. You know, they can, they can utilize the data uh, as, as they see fit and then turn around and uh, do a POC. I mean, it's the, the faster you can get to a POV or a POC, a proof of value, proof of concept, you know, for uh, someone like me or an organization, um, the better, because then you can actually see how it's going to operate in your environment. Uh, you can kick the tires all day long and there's no way to tell until you do a POV. So I would always, and that's why back 10 years ago, there weren't a lot, I mean, asking for a POV from a vendor was, well, they, there were few. But it, it wasn't as easy. It's more difficult. To, it's more it's more difficult to do then. Now now it's just like oh, it's just a software license. We'll just turn it on and we'll turn it off. Like now well, it's, it's becoming a lot easier to do. Well, that. it is it is a lot easier because of the cloud environment and because it's not on. Well, there are some companies that yeah, still have on prem. Still I'm not, on component you sometimes in some of the, like SD WAN or some technologies. So yeah. 
I, I, I'm sorry, you cut out there a little bit on the video. Can you? Oh, yeah, I mean, no, I'm the... just saying there's still some some on-prem technologies that coincide with the cloud, like SD WAN, some phone systems, etc. Right. So there are some things that still you need still need something on-prem, an on-prem component. Um, but the, most of it lives in the cloud now, as far as like the license and like where the magic actually happens is mostly happening in the cloud now. Um, well, and we've pivoted uh, again as technology changes and we're more SaaS oriented. OK, we're more uh, cloud oriented to the point of now uh, from a security perspective, we have to have somebody in a position of vendor management and they have to be really good. They can't just be a contract negotiator. It's not just procurement. It's vendor management, you know, at first started to be just procurement people, right? right it's right. not vendor management's not procurement. Vendor management is, okay, so how good of a partner do I have not only from the technology perspective, but from a security perspective? Oh yeah, no, that's huge. Like are, are they willing to sign a BAA, right? Are they are they willing to do this? Are they are they, you know, are they meeting you where you are essentially right that's what that's what you need that's absolutely what you need and so you can eliminate you, you know you can quickly eliminate them by a few questions <laughs> you know um and if they're not uh, not it's difficult because you know hackers can get into them and then pass through and get to you so you know there's this whole ecosystem that becomes uh, you can't just think about your own on-prem or cloud uh, uh, infrastructure. I'm going to say it in that way, okay? It, sure. it can't be just about where where your your edge is. Your edge now extends to all the vendors and any kind of product delivery that you have, any kind of supply chain, anything that's in your your framework that you do business with, that's the extent, and that's where vendor management comes into play. So you have to have a security professional or and or a risk professional that can, you know, actually know and how to manage not only contracts with those SaaS vendors. And ironically enough, you, I, I'm, I'm going to do another shout out because. Kyle, you've been very instrumental in helping with those because that is your expertise. You really act as a vendor management person because you have those skill sets and you have a whole ecosystem that can be brought to the table where it, you're like me in many ways, only you're focused on the cloud, which I really respect and have, have a lot of faith in. Yeah, I appreciate that. And just like you mentioned earlier, I mean, I'm a truth seeker. Like that's in summary, trusted advisor. Yeah, but I'm a, I'm a truth seeker. So I'm out there constantly seeking the truth uh, with all the vendors that I work with and like, you know, what actually works. Now, I don't want to hear about um, theories. I want to see it actually working. I want to see it actually solving the problem before I feel comfortable saying, hey, this actually solves the problem. But I will also mention again, the other three vendors that have been very, uh, they have the same culture uh, or ideology, um, very customer support, very open and transparent. Um, and that's Last Line and Merlin and Unitrends. I have to mention those along with you as uh, as a vendor. And, and I, I nobody's nobody's paying me to do this. I'm just saying, you know, I, I think uh, that. We have a, a challenge out here uh, and we need to make sure that we partner with the right people that can really be, a, they have to prioritize our culture uh, first and our resources first, just as much as we do. In other words, they, I have to, they have to be able to do business. I have to trust them to, 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 to care a, a, as much about my business as they do their own. You said it best uh, in a previous conversation we had. You said um, a trusted advisor makes the customer's priorities their priorities. And, and yes. I, I really love that. That's exactly, that's exactly it. And it really is even now the customer's customer. You yeah. have to think even beyond the first leg, but oh, the yeah. second leg, right? Right. Well, um, so, you know, 
uh, last last thing for you before we get into a little bonus round here. Um, but so you just launched uh, Elevate Exchange January. That COVID nineteen happened. We kind of got into like now what, but you know now what? Well, okay, so we're pivoting to do a lot more online. May seventh, as I said before, James Carpenter from Texas Right Children's, well, uh, Scottish Right, sorry, Texas Scottish Right Children's, um, uh, will. He's the CISO. He's going to talk about, but see, we, I love this because he's, uh, he's a first responder. Yeah. I mean, people think about, we, you know, media is all over. We're talking about the nurses, the doctors, they're all first responders out there. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, God, you know, bless them. Okay. They keep us alive, but nobody thinks about the, the technology first responder because without the data, without the accuracy without, you know, doctors being able to be serviced by the technology people behind the scenes, they couldn't be who they need to be. So what James is going to offer or talk about is, you know, what he had to go through from a hospital perspective, you know, as a first, as a technology first responder on May 7th. Okay. That's next. And then on June, June 4th, uh, the next Elevate Exchange will be a panel discussion. Um, and that's, we can talk about that. That will be posted on the Elevate uh, Exchange website. It'll be a panel dis dis discussion um, uh, led by Rusty Kennington um, and four other uh, wonderful uh, upper, you know, C's. They're either CISOs or VPs or CIOs. Um, but it's more, it will be more about uh, digital transformation, you know, those kinds of things. And that's also a part of what we're experiencing now is it is a form of digital transformation to have to move your whole workforce online. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, that, that just about wraps up the show. If you guys have any questions, uh, let us know. We're going to jump into a, a little round of uh, speed dial right now. So, Robin, these are some... Uh, Questions that are more personal uh, about you. Some of these should be pretty quick to answer. But uh, so in your opinion, what is the best business book of all time? Oh, wow. I'm sorry. I'm old person. So still seven habits for high, uh, for high, for effective. People. I'm sorry. It was the Stephen Covey series. I love Stephen Covey. So that was, those are the books I read. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I think was the name of the title. Okay, nice. Uh, what is a digital resource like an app or a website that you know, publicly available that you could not live without? Oh, the FTC. Um, frankly, a lot of people miss that. Uh, the FTC? Yes, the Federal Trade Commission. Okay. Uh, they monitor fraud and they monitor, they, they really are the governance for, even though they're, gov they're a government body, they are the governance to take these companies to court. Uh, they're the ones who uh, put out bulletins all the time on, you know, uh, that show trends that are happening in fraud. And fraud's a big part of security. And I think that's something we miss. Um, yeah, awesome. And then uh, in IT, uh, what is the number one characteristic that you would look for in like hiring somebody to work on your team or? or being a part of somebody on the team? Well, the first question I ask them is, what's your risk diversity? Okay. Um, it, it's a very, it's a benchmark for me. It's not necessarily that I care whether, how high a risk uh, adverse they are or how low a risk adverse they are. It's more about whether they've had a thought process around it or what that might mean to them. So. That's my first interview question every time. I love that. I actually love that. Uh, what would you go back and tell your 20-year-old self? Oh, wow. That's a very good question because I was like a mover and shaker when I was, you know, 20. I mean, I was the guru on campus when I was 20 in technology. I never thought of it that way. Uh, people used to follow me to class just asking me technology questions, you know, IT questions. And that was back when we were on mainframes, you know, help me fix this logic. Okay. Wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, I didn't even have snowball. I mean, I never had a class in snowball. 
you know, and they would follow me around, but it's syntax, you know, it's all the same thing. It was more about the logic. So I would always help students fix their problems. So back 20, uh, what was the question again? Back what when would, I was 20? What, what would you tell yourself in your 20s? Well, I think I would say be a lot more patient. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I still have problems with that. You know, I, I, uh, I, uh, I think that, you know, as we get older, thank goodness, uh, two things, I think, be a lot more patient and listen a lot more. Listen, listen first. It, and, and the one thing I do when I advise, I'm, you know, I'm like a, I, I do mentor people. The one thing I do do is say, remember, it's not about you. No matter what I, capital IT, no matter what it is, nothing is ever about you. It is never about you. So those are the three things that I would say that wow. I would. That, that's powerful. Um, is there a CEO or a profession, professional athlete or famous person out there that you wish you could meet? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, well, they're all dead. <laughs> we, we can bring him back for this question. <laughs> um, well, Golda Meir, um, uh, Gandhi. I know I'm not, I'm Christian, but you know, uh, there's a man with complete patience, <laughs> you know, um, I would say probably of all the people, Gandhi would be my, because he, he lived, I think the way all of us should live. Excellent. And, uh, last thing, uh, what would you say is like the number one thing that you do daily, like a habit or something like that to keep yourself dialed in, uh, to what, oh. you're, what you're working on to life? Well, the first thing I do, uh, <laughs> you're going to think this is funny. First thing I do when I get up is I stretch. Okay. Um, I used to be a gym rep, but now that we're stay at home. So very first thing in order to get my blood moving and my brain moving, the very first thing I do is stretch. Okay. The second thing I do is, well, I read my Bible. Okay. So I have... You know, I, I don't read much. I don't have to read much. I have, you know, a page. I read one page of my Bible every day in order to put me on the path of, you know, thinking the right way. So I believe uh, I go to Elevate Life Church uh, and I I believe exactly what they say. If you elevate your thinking, you elevate your life. So I I believe that if you read something, uh, or listen to tapes. And I'm not saying you need to listen, you know, be a, a, a self, um, constantly read, you know, uh, listen to tapes all the time. But I am saying that positivity is the number one thing, uh, that you need to have in your brain every day. And every negative circumstance always has, I mean, always throughout my whole life has a positive re has ended up being a positive thing. I may not have known it at the time, but it always ended up that way. And when every time I reflected back, so one of the things I do every morning is reflect back on, okay, here's where I'm at. And the challenges that I've faced in the past month, what will that mean to me in the future? And see if I can put a positive spin on everything. I I don't have a negative bone in my body anymore. I, I've changed since I was 20, okay? Um, everything I look at from a, a conflict, chaos, uh, challenge, uh, what seems to be uh, uh, difficulty in my life, I always go, I can always see the broader picture and go, wow, you know what? Out of this, I'm going to learn patient. I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn this, this, and this. So I hope that helps. Awesome. Well, thank you, Robin. I, I so appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, last, last, last thing. Uh, is there anything that um, I didn't ask you that I was supposed to, ah. uh, that you would have asked me? What would you have asked me if you were in my shoes? <laughs> That's funny. It's like, 
you know, one of the questions I ask when I get on a, a Zoom call with a, a vendor is, uh, okay, what do I don't know that I, what, what, what do I need to know that I don't know? And they laugh. Exactly. And they, I, in other words, that's, what are your weaknesses? In other words, you know, what do I don't know that I need to know? Exactly. Okay? Exactly. So, so that would be the question that I would ask, you know, which is what you just asked. Me. What do I don't know that I need to know? Um, well, I guess what I would ask you is, um, what, what, what kind of future, you know, everybody has goals, everybody has projections. So what I would ask is, you know, in the next 90 days, because, well, I should say 30, because yeah. the way things are changing, we're changing on a dime. And I think resiliency has to be a part of that. I mean, you have to personally have to be resilient. OK, right. Right. every day you wake up, there's a whole new list of things, even though you're planned from the day before. OK, things pop up. You have to be able to think on your feet. So if I were going to ask you, I would say. Where are you going to be in 30 days? Where do you think you're going to be in 30 days? I'm going to be on the Internet in 30 days <laughs> every day. Just about. So, yeah, that's that's where I'm going to be. So, um I mean, in simplest form, right? So doing this is, is what I love to do. Hearing your story, telling other people's stories and, and bringing it out and, and just sharing the value among all of us and bringing all of us together um, in a digital way, in a virtual way. Uh, I, think, I think that's what that's what I do best. So it's time to shine right now. Time to, time to bring it all together. So I'm ready to go. Well, and I'm, I want to thank you for all your help as a, a vendor in my community because um, it, 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 you know, I... Although uh, my skill set might stretch, I, I, I'm limited. You know, I, I only have so many hours in the day. So having you even as a part of my trusted advisorship is huge from a cloud perspective. So I want to thank you for your time. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you as well, Robin. Uh, where, where can people best connect with you or um, find out more information about what you're working on? Basically, where do you want people to go after this? Well, you can go to my, I'd rather you go to link at my Elevate Exchange. Uh, I mean, that's my swan song. And that's, I'm trying to help as many people. The community is really my goal. Okay. That's, so Elevate IT, uh, it's eitevents.com slash uh, Elevate dash exchange is, uh, is the website. Uh, but also you can go to my LinkedIn profile or the, yeah because I constantly um uh, post on that uh I'm constantly trying to I'm, I'm trying to do better I I I did one more thing is that when I the last dinner I went to I have to admit I I uh I got one of my peers come up and said to me that uh, they were reading my post and I was surprised because I never get any response back and some I mean I'm talking about my my positive you know, messages. I send out positive messages all the time uh, to keep people in a in a in a a better mindset. You know, elevate your thinking, kind of thing. And ironically, I never really. I just kept doing. I never knew if they were looking at them or not because nobody hardly responded. Um, and when I was at the dinner, they kept saying, "Oh yeah, you got to keep doing that. You got to keep doing that." I went, "Are you reading them?" <laughs> and they said, "Yeah, we're reading them." I went. Okay, so it's funny, but ever since I formed or really uh, was was helping to form Elevate Exchange, now I'm getting a little bit more responses. Okay, so it's about the community. So I really need to hear from you. Um, you know, I, I need to hear about if you're a member. Uh, you know, you need to join Elevate Exchange because I only have so much bandwidth. So my my time is part is to to service the members and advisors of Elevate IT and members of Elevate Exchange, excuse me, uh, those advisors of Elevate IT are already members of Elevate Exchange, but you can be, you know, but if you don't want to be an advisor of Elevate IT or are not yet, you can still be a member of Elevate Exchange by filling out and clicking on, you know, uh, contact. There's a, there's a place on the website that you can click on to, to join. And that would be the, probably the best thing. Those people who know me, already reach out to me on messaging on on LinkedIn and I use that that service a lot. I mean, I live there, okay? 
Awesome. Awesome. So optimism, be patient and join Elevate Exchange if you're an IT director level or above. Awesome, Robin. Thanks. Thank you so much for uh, being on the show today. And I'll catch everybody else uh, on the next show next week. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kyle.